I'd like to welcome uh, our orator today, John Fain. Uh, he's, known, he's known my parents, it's exciting to have him on. I'd like to welcome our scholarship recipients who are here, and I'd like to welcome all of you. The format of the session will be following myself and Gemma. John will give his oration, and then he and Larry will, uh, will have a Q&A. The session is being recorded, and the link will be shared post-event. The chat function in the Zoom has been disabled and will be used for announcements. If you want to submit questions during the oration, do it by the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and please include an introduction uh, where you're from and your question, obviously. As we explore the language of Australian history since white settlement, the absence of Indigenous voices is profound. This absence has meant that the meaning of many words that we regularly use has until recently not been challenged, enabling many simple words when used in, the con in this context to be weaponized. Words like discovered, settled and explored, concepts like leaseholder and native protection, or phrases like clearing the scrub, contain very different meanings to those of us who perceive their history as being defined by either pre or post white settlement stories. Common words and concepts like these were used to prosecute and to cloak the brutality of the European settlement of Australia without challenge. To achieve a true reconciliation, the meaning of these words is a debate that needs to be had. It's normal to assume that language is firm and a word's meaning is absolute. Just look in the dictionary, you, you might say. But language is fluid and meanings evolve. The path from dialect to language, from small groups to larger ones, is through agreement on common, on common meanings. Sorry, is it coming through? Okay. Agreement on common meanings. Much as tributaries become a river, dialects become a language. And a common language is fundamental to a coherent community. Between groups, this fuzziness in the meaning of words is refined through conversation and trust in language can only come through its shared use and the open debate of ideas and concepts. Today, as we gather more of our information through social and digital means, the impact on language has been severe. Conversations between groups has become fewer and fewer ideas are debated. Rather, we find that versions of the truth are being argued. This is reflected by the instability in key words such as honesty, truth, lies and integrity, and it leads to the fracturing of language back into dialects. Renata Kamener, my mother, believed deeply in the value of talking and in discussion to solve problems. Factions and warring parties trusted her to help solve their issues. Her first tool in problem solving was conversation, usually over food and often at our kitchen table. She firmly believed that there is more that unites us than divides us, and she trusted that the sharing of words would lead to shared meanings, to a common language, and then to solutions. An English teacher, she knew that words were fluid, slippery sometimes, but that meaning is deeper and more timeless. And so if we could get below the complexity of words to shared meaning, that we could resolve most issues. The Renata Kamala Scholarship, in its partnership with Ormond College, seeks to promote Indigenous voices by helping to fund Indigenous students through our tertiary education system. The so-called gap is least amongst tertiary educated Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. And so this is one way to help address Indigenous disadvantage. In doing so, the Australian community will need to become used to hearing and embracing strong Indigenous voices in our national debates. We simply can't continue to boo them off the field when they get loud. I look forward to hearing our orator today, someone to whom words and their meaning matter, John Fain. I'd like to congratulate this year's scholarship holder, Gemma Bryce, and I will pass the screen over to her. Hello, everyone. I would like to open today by proudly acknowledging the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people 
as the first people and traditional owners and custodians of the land and water in which we meet, wherever that may be for you today. For me, that is on the land of the Wurundjeri people. This land provides for us during our time on earth. We must care for and respect the land as it does us. I pay my respects to the ancestors of this country, elders, past, present and emerging, and the resilience and strength of previous generations that have come before us. I recognise and value the ongoing contributions of Aboriginal people and communities to life and how it continues to enrich society today. My name is Gemma and I'm a proud Palawa woman from Tasmania. I made the move to Melbourne last year to study biomedicine at the University of Melbourne. I'm currently in my second year and plan on continuing on to study medicine once I finish my undergrad. I have a passion for health studies and hope to eventually go out and work in rural Indigenous communities and developing countries as a doctor one day. When I started at Ormond, I met Riley Warmall, a fellow Indigenous student at the college. Both Riley and I are extremely honoured and deeply grateful to be this year's Kamenar Scholarship recipients. This scholarship has allowed both Riley and I to not only live at Ormond, create new friendships and experiences, but also challenge ourselves to take on new roles within the college community. I have been lucky enough to be a member of the Student Support Subcommittee this year and provide both mental health guidance and support wherever possible within the college community. And Riley has done an incredible job as head of the Ormond College Indigenous Subcommittee. Living in a community like Ormond with so many amazing and ambitious people and the constant support and encouragement from staff has had a massive impact on me. Whilst being at Ormond, I've pushed myself to take on new opportunities, which I previously would never have considered pursuing. Last summer, I comp completed my first internship at the Department of Health and Human Services, working in mental health and Aboriginal social and emotional wellbeing. I've also been lucky enough to secure an internship this summer at the Peter McCollin Cancer Centre, where I'll work in wellbeing and, pa and the patient experience team. I want to thank the Allman College community and the Kamenar family for their gener generous support and for helping me find the confidence and determination to pursue the things I am passionate about. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Jane Fremantle and the Allman College Student Club for planting the seed for the Allman College Indigenous Program in 2008. Thank you to everyone attending the oration today and donating funds that will support other First Nations students in the future. And if such generosity allows further supporting Indigenous organisations, such as the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency, an incredible organisation that supports Aboriginal children in care to heal and connect to their culture, also relies on donations and fundraisers to fund cultural programs and provide assistance to families in need. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. That was, um, that was great. It's always to me a highlight of these orations to hear from the scholarship recipients. Um, and their backgrounds and we've, we've stayed in touch with with many of the scholarship recipients who have gone on to do fabulous things. Um, it's my great pleasure to to introduce John, uh, someone who's um, very much beloved by you know, many many people in Melbourne, maybe there's a few that don't like him as well I'm sure. Um, but first thing to know about Don is, uh, John is that he's not actually an Australian, he's a Kiwi. Uh, he was born in Dunedin, moved subsequently to Sydney and then did a BA of Arts and Law, uh, but two BAs, one in Arts and one in Law at uh, Monash University. Um, he then went to work on as a solicitor at Barker, Hardy & Co, at Holdick, Redlick & Co, and at Fitzroy Legal Service. And during that time, he also worked um, on the Social Security Appeals Tribunal uh, alongside um, our father, uh, Bob Kamener. And that's where one of the family connections uh, with John came about. Um, he was also able to, in his, early in his career as a lawyer, to combine his love of cars uh, with being a lawyer, and he was a motoring reporter for a, a legal magazine. Um, in 1989, John moved to radio, um, starting off the law report on, on Radio National. Um, and then he went on to work on a variety of ABC programs until 1996, when he was invited to host 774's breakfast show, where many of us have got to know him. Um, as well as the conversation now. And in a little while, it'll be my pleasure to reverse those roles and ask uh, John the questions this time. But we should also acknowledge John's great career as a hockey player. Uh, we were discussing this before we came to air 
about you know where where was John's love from hockey uh, that come from, and maybe he'll enlighten that. He'll he'll enlighten us about that later. So John, um, it's uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say, and then going to conversation with you. A uh, very generous introduction, and uh, I appreciate that. And the less said about my hockey career, the better. There's no doubt about that. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, as have those who have spoken before me. And I'd like to go further than just acknowledging the traditional owners. I'd like to express my impatience for a treaty or treaties as decided by those who we are seeking to enter into a treaty with. It is a glaring omission and a gaping hole in Australia's soul, a wound in the soul of this country, that the injustices upon which we were founded and which were perpetuated in massacre after massacre right up until the 1920s, that has never been resolved and that terrible start to the founding of a nation has never been dealt with by the people who have come subsequently. And I want to make a link between the Kaminars, who I had the pleasure of knowing, and that issue of Indigenous injustice, which I know they both felt very strongly about. And in so doing, I need to tell you a bit about my own parents, who may even be watching as we speak in their 95th year. They both just turned 94 and were good friends of Renata and Bobby Kaminar. And when I started working at the SSAT as a sessional tribunal member, one of the things I did was decide as the chair of a tribunal panel whether or not someone was or wasn't entitled to an invalid pension, which means you sit with a doctor alongside you and a social worker. And the doctor very often was Bobby Kaminar. And I got to know Bob quite separately from the fact that he was a friend of my parents and had a deep appreciation of just what a magnificent person, what a deep and careful thinker he was about the issues that we were being asked to adjudicate upon. Around about the same time, my mother was part of a group created by Renata, which was called Salam Shalom. Whether it was Shalom Salam or Salam Shalom, well, that was resolved by the Muslim community participants, women who formed with Jewish women a cooking circle. They formed an initiative to try and break down some of the traditional and historic hostilities between the two groups. And Renata was one of the founding and driving forces of that. And it was a wonderful thing that my mother spoke of frequently and generously about Renata's work there. And it was a sign, I think, of an attempt to deal with intergenerational trauma. And both the Muslim community and the Jewish community have experienced terrible things that have created trauma and then intergenerational trauma. The offspring and even the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors in the Jewish community talk about the trauma of the Holocaust. Well, let me flip that to Australia in our contemporary setting. Imagine if you're the grandchild of one of those people who were massacred in 1926 at Mile Creek, or if you're one of those people whose grandfather was taken around the Pilbara or the Kimberley in neck chains because they dared to kill one of the cows that roamed on their land which were not owned by them, but they saw no distinction, of course, and were punished, sometimes flogged. And I've just read a story last week of a famous pastoralist in the Northern Territory whose practice when capturing Aboriginals who'd taken one of their cows on the Vesti Station, Wave Hill, the Gurindji community, famous for the walk-off and the handover that Gough Whitten did so many years later. The practice of this particular man when capturing people who he thought were responsible for taking one of his cows was to rasp the soles of their feet so they could not escape and then tie them to a tree until sometimes days later he was prepared to take them for what he regarded as the appropriate punishment back at the camp. Intergenerational trauma, I think, afflicts all of Australia and we have to deal with it. So if we have a look at this extraordinary year that 2020 has turned into and I was asked to speak to you and it's a great honour to do so about a topic of my choice I came up with what did I call it why the world will never be the same again but nothing changes and yes COVID and the pandemic it's at the moment it's the only thing we can think about but in fact if you have a look at the long trajectory of history even the trajectory of a country with such a short recorded history as this one COVID is just a little blip 
It's the tiniest little blip in the timeline. It will pass. One of the things that's concerning me in all the discussions at the moment about the pandemic is that people are talking about this as if it's the only thing in the world. I'm overwhelmed by the negative reporting that I've seen. So many stories, so many reporters, so many journalists, so many radio and television programs and newspapers, all looking for the next bad angle that they can find to report what's going on. Now, there is no doubt there are bad things going on. There is no doubt there are people who are going through this very, very tough. There are people whose businesses are in trouble, whose jobs have evaporated, whose livelihoods have disappeared, and their anxiety and stress levels are through the roof. But if you looked at the Australian media today, you'd think they were the only people in the country and the entire nation had gone to hell in a handbasket, which of course is not the truth. What has happened is that discretionary spending on things like hospitality and tourism have completely collapsed. But the point of those things is that they are discretionary. They're not the bedrock of the economy, as I wrote the other day in the newspaper. And I don't know whether I would have been doing this if I was still doing a daily radio program and still every morning going to work and looking for yet another unexplored angle. My goodness, what can we say today? Day 100, how can we cover this and find a fresh thing to say? It's so hard. And it is. You've got to fill the airtime. You can't go on air at 8.30 and say, not much has happened, can't talk about anything today. It doesn't work that way. Incredibly, there seems to be a default setting to the bad news stories. And it's the oldest saying in media, if it bleeds, it bleeds. And what I think is going on, and this infects, talking of infections, it infects the public mood. And I think a good part of what's happened, certainly in this city where we've been going through now how many weeks of lockdown, is that people are starting to realise we've adapted, many of us. We've pivoted. We found other things to do. There was, a, I think, the first time I saw in the papers, one of the papers today, there was a story from someone saying, look, I feel a bit guilty saying this, but I've really enjoyed the lockdown. Now, I know plenty of people who have enjoyed the lockdown and plenty of people who have done very well. You know, at the end of the war, World Wars I and II, there were always people who were described as having had a good war. Well, there are people who have had a good pandemic, but you felt you couldn't say anything because it was, it was you know, unfathomable that you could admit that things were going okay for you because so many other people were not experiencing that. And I think there's a level there, whether it's pressure, peer pressure, community pressure, political correctness, whatever it is, call it what you like. I think there's been an imbalance in the reporting. And I'd hate to think that I would have been doing that if I was still on the radio. But I just, I can't believe the role the media has played in this. It's worthy of multiple PhDs, probably. I've been astonished to read, and I read widely, but I can pick up one of the tabloids here. People writing that, and in the Australian the other week, the economics editor, who you think would be a reasonably sensible person, his name's Adam Crichton, let's give him a name, he wrote that he thinks the governor should intervene in Victoria and sack the Premier and his government. What universe do these people live on? At the same time, prominent columnists in the Herald Sun are writing that they think there needs to be federal intervention. At one stage, people were talking about the army coming in. What, they want to stage a coup in Victoria? What is going on in these people's heads? I just don't understand. Okay, yes, yeah, sure. Andrew's government made some big mistakes. They're going to be held accountable for it. They'll be held accountable by Jenny Coate in her inquiry, I'm absolutely sure. They'll be held accountable possibly in the courts. We'll see what happens. There's a chance for people to hold them to account when we go next to the polls. But the mentality that seems to have enveloped some people that the best thing they can do to advance the, the, the cause of people in Victoria at the moment is to rip down the government and throw Victoria into some form of chaos, to me seems well, irresponsible. What other word can you use? It is insane. The government, are, I mean, it's like saying you want to somehow turn the fire brigade upside down in the middle of a massive bushfire and you want to cause some sort of leadership gap at the time when the people are holding a hose and fighting the fire. The federal government have seized the opportunity through partisan uh, leverage to try and help their colleagues in the Liberal Party in Victoria and have also done their share of undermining in Victoria. It's extraordinary. We started off with the National Cabinet and bipartisanship and we had great cooperation and it hasn't endured. And I find it extraordinary that the, the goodwill 
that was there hasn't lasted, it's not been sustainable, and the needs of the people of Victoria have not been put first. The first thing we have to do in the middle of this pandemic is get the numbers down, get the infection under control, and then go around laying blame and then go around shortening people's careers of which there have been a few and there probably will be some more. But to think that the good or responsible or sensible or smart maybe thing to do is to tear the government down while you have the opportunity, I don't understand it. I just don't understand it. Focus group polling has shown people when asked in focus groups, they hate the politicisation of the treatment of the pandemic. It might even backfire on those who have been trying to do it. It's going to be very interesting to see, I suspect, and I've written this in the paper, uh, if the government, state and federal, if they get the rebuild right, I suspect by the time Victoria goes to the polls, which is more than two years away, this will be a historical artefact, if indeed the rebuild is well managed, if we come out of it well. And there will be some people along the way, they'll get, they'll get chopped off, and that's how politics works. You live by the sword and die by the sword. Sometimes you feel sorry for them, sometimes, well, there's a lot of other people to feel sorry for before you get round to them. But that is the way of politics and we'll have a chance eventually in this robust democracy that I hope we still are, we'll have a chance to hold people to account when we get to the polls. But in the meantime, I think part of the frenzy from the Liberal Party and their supporters and boosters, in particular in the Murdoch media, is that they can sense their moment of opportunity slipping away. And they feel, well, we had a chance there. We had our moment where we might have been able to knock off Dan Andrews and fatally wound the Labor government for the last two years of this term of parliament. And they're sensing that it might be slipping away. And so they're ramping up the frenzy. They're ramping up the activity and they're giving it one last gasp because I think they realise, and I suspect this is true, when the numbers are down to next to nothing and we have the euphoria of lifting the restrictions that we're all living under, then the opportunity will have gone. So I'm worried about that. The other thing that troubles me, and still being a media commentator, which I now have the luxury of doing, and I'm sure there'll be questions when we get to it. So Larry's going to invite your questions as well as throw me a few curveballs of his own. So you're welcome to, in the Q&A se section of the, at the bottom of your screen, if you move your cursor down, it comes up with a whole bunch of little icons, one of which of course is Q and A, and you can write a question there and then Larry's gonna throw it at me. One of the things that astonishes me when we talk about accountability is the double standard of accountability. Because at the moment, in my personal view, there's a half a dozen ministers in the current federal government who by any measure should have either resigned or been sacked. And certainly by the standard Dan Andrews has put Jenny McCarkos to, there's no doubt that Richard Colbeck, the aged care minister, his position is completely, completely unsustainable. Mr. Fletcher, who I've always got on very well with, Paul Fletcher is the Minister for Communications, but he sold a $3 million parcel of land for $30 million to a Liberal Party donor as part of the Sydney Airport land grab and says, oh, well, not my fault. I didn't get a proper briefing on it. Sorry, doesn't wash minister. I can't believe that Michael Sukar is still a minister in the government, not just a minister, but the assistant treasurer, after he's been absolutely busted using taxpayer funded staff for Liberal Party internal affairs. Well, when the whole red shirts thing exploded here in Victoria, you couldn't escape the demands for resignations and sackings from the Murdoch media then, holding the Labor government to account, but the double standard, the completely different standard by which Michael Sukar is being held to account is quite inexplicable. Angus Taylor faking a document, someone in his office is responsible for faking a document which he then owns to try and embarrass Clover Moore, the, uh, the, the green leaning uh, mayor of Sydney. I mean, it's extraordinary stuff. Alan Tudge has been held to be uh, engaging in criminal behavior and in contempt virtually of the federal court and rulings in relation to asylum seekers, just completely ignoring them and having nothing to do with it. And likewise on RoboDebt, which is I suspect about to get even bigger, but just shrugging it off. Oh, well, you know, there are 72 decisions of the courts telling the federal government that RoboDebt was wrong, that were all ignored internally, didn't care, just kept going. So I do not understand the double standard. I just don't get it. And I don't understand why the media at the moment aren't pursuing things the way they need to be pursued. The argument for an anti-corruption body in Australia, it's over. There is no further discussion about it. But the failure to actually do it 
to actually bring it in and bring it in structured so that it can do its job, again, absolutely inexplicable. And yet, instead of there being an outrage and a, you know, a furor about it, everyone goes, oh, well, they're working on it, they're coming up with it, they're getting there sooner or later. And then things like JobKeeper rorts. I mean, I do not understand why there aren't people out in the street. Well, we're not allowed to be out in the street, but virtually even. I don't understand the lack of outrage when some of our biggest and most profitable companies are using JobKeeper to pay special dividends to their shareholders and bonuses to some of their directors straight from the taxpayer purse. It's a straight transfer. There's tens of millions of dollars going straight from a subsidy because they're supposedly about to go broke into the pockets of the people who need it least, not most. So somewhere along the way, things have started going really, really wrong. And the role of the media, which is always in my view and all through my 30 years at the ABC, was my view, our job is to hold power to account. It's not working. So very quickly, because I know my time is well and truly up, very quickly, the media isn't doing its job. It's just not working anymore. Print, radio, television, online, what's now called the fifth estate, social media is bleeding traditional media dry. And absolutely vital to get things back on track, in my view, is to make social media, just like any other publisher, accountable for what it publishes. And to take away the anonymity that people use to say appalling things, to turn themselves into trolls online and get away with just character assassination and some of the most vile personal abuse imaginable. And hey, not my problem, I can do it, I can get away with it, no one holds them to account. These are structural flaws. So when I say things will never be the same again, well, yes, our world has changed, but nothing changes, we've still got some of the same problems. We still have to deal with some of the same problems. Treaty, what I'm calling uh, unaccountability in, in the media at the moment, and another favorite of mine, digital authoritarianism. We've got not just the problem of people who are doing shocking things online, but increasingly now a surveillance state through online as well. Big problems, but not insurmountable though. I'm still an optimist. Just remember, progress, is neither inevitable nor linear. So it doesn't just move along a line. You have to make it happen and you have to keep moving it in the right direction. Every now and again, it'll go on a little detour. Sometimes it'll go backwards before it keeps going forwards, but it's not inevitable. It happens because people make it happen. And we have to ramp up our participation in democracy. We have to maintain this delicate machine and we have to get back to being much more involved which takes us back to Renata and Bobby Kamina. They were in their quiet and unassuming way, wonderful role models and examples. They were activists and my parents also, active participants, they did things. Yes, we like to play with our toys, we like to go on nice trips, we like to eat nice food, but we have to be involved in society as well. If we want to get the benefit of it, we have to assist with its maintenance. So there's a few things which I hope are food for us all to chew on. I'm looking forward to your questions and thank you very much for joining in today for the Renata Kamina 11th oration. Thanks, John. Um, lots, lots to work with there and uh, I'm delighted to see that the Q&A is running hot. And I don't know how you did it, John, maybe you had someone to help you, but there is a lot of questions in here, so I'm trying to work out how I will get through them all, but let's, let's, let's get started. Um, you talk about holding um, governments to account, be it state or federal. Um, and I'm just interested in your thoughts about how that should properly be done. I mean, you, yes, we, you know, there's an election coming. Um, there's going to be, a, you know, the outcome of a just judicial inquiry. Um, but the whole question about, you know, when, when ministers should, should resign, in some cases for activities of their department, um, how do we, you know, what are your thoughts on what good accountability should look like and, and how, can we be, how can it be improved? It's, I think, a, a sign of failure by the opposition at the moment that they don't, for whatever reason, and I could provide you with half a dozen, I suspect, uh, they don't seem to be able to cut through, whether it's to do with the leader, whether it's to do with their internal issues, whether it's to do with the hostility with which they deal with large sections of the media, whether it's to do with their lack of creativity. Uh, whether it's to do with their preoccupation with other things, I'm not absolutely sure. I've got a few ideas, but I don't pretend to have the answer. 
there's no doubt that even on the floor of the parliament, uh, they do not have a match for a formidable opponent, and Scott Morrison is exactly that. I think he's been underestimated by a lot of people, and uh, there's a tendency for people on the left, I think it's a bit smug, but they uh, tend to make fun of anybody who they disagree with rather than take them seriously, analyse what they do and work out strategies in order to combat it. I think there's a complacency on the part of some people that they got so close at the last election, they changed leader and they think that's all we have to do in order to win the next one, which is completely wrong, utterly wrong. You could not be more wrong. And I think there is a failure in some parts of the media. And I think some of the media get away at the moment with being players rather than in fact being reporters or analysts and questioners and interrogators. And I am a bit disappointed actually uh, with uh, the failure of some of the other people who are still in the media to hold some of their own recalcitrance to account. Um, I've recovered from the bruises that were regularly inflicted upon me in my more than 20 years on the morning show on ABC Radio Melbourne, but I carry whatever scars as a badge of honour. And if you're not getting up the nose of some of the people who you're up against in the media, you're not doing your own job properly, in my view. If you want to call it out and see it how it is, then you have to be absolutely fearless. If it's a, a choice between being respected and being liked, you have to be respected every time. And there are, at the moment, I think there are some atrocities being committed in the Australian media and it, no one seems to be doing anything about it. So one of the vehicles that um, governments frequently go to um, to determine accountability um, is either judicial inquiries or royal commissions. And we've seen a lot of those when things go wrong. Sometimes it allows the government to, to push off an issue for a year or two and, and to be seen to have done something um, sometimes there is a real case for someone independent. What I'm interested in is your thoughts about um, the role of getting judges, typically it's judges who lead these um, uh, judicial inquiries or royal commissions, to do what I think are two things. One is to determine accountability, which we just talked about, but the other is often to learn the lessons, uh, whether it's bushfires, whether it's you know the, the whole uh, response to the pandemic, uh, whether it's financial services, uh, rorts by banks, judges are often brought to, to, to come up with recommendations on how to reform that. And I'm interested in your thoughts about, you know, whether, what is the role of judicial inquiries, royal commissions? Are they overused? Are they a very important part of independent accountability? Um, and, you know, are judges being stretched somewhat in terms of what they're being asked to do? Uh, we've got a... Um... We've, we've got a litigation boom in Melbourne at the moment. Um, you can't get a top barrister for love or money at the moment. And it's terrific because all those barristers, kids, orthodontists bills have to be paid somehow, Larry. But given Hain has just finished and then we went straight into Gobbo, the Royal Commission that, I mean, you know, the gift that keeps on giving, it's the magic pudding of Royal Commissions, that one, it's extraordinary. And now we've had an elderly... Elder Abuse Royal Commission, and now Jenny Coates doing a quick job on the uh, COVID response. There's undoubtedly going to be more and there need to be more because you never know, as Ken Hain showed with his Financial Services Royal Commission into banks, you never know where they're gonna go. And they do sometimes go off. I mean, you know, Costigan and the whole painters and dockers thing went off in a direction no one ever foresaw either. So. I think they're absolutely essential, but nothing will be as good as a properly resourced and properly structured anti-corruption body. It would be unimaginable at the state level to go back to the days where you didn't have an anti-corruption body and every state now has them. The fact that there isn't one working in Australia today, I find laughable. And the Liberal Party in power now for however many years, uh, five, have managed to just put it off. They just keep pushing it down the road, kicking the can down the road. Now, I'm sure any government that's in power doesn't really like the idea of an anti-corruption body because you just don't know what's going on in some of the dark corners of your own operations. But at the same time, you can't argue. I mean, one day the Liberal Party is going to find itself in opposition and it's going to desperately want an anti-corruption body. So, you know, they should set one up because it's going to be very useful to them, whether it's in the next term or the term after. Sooner or later, it's going to be needed. But on a public interest argument, it's just a no-brainer. It has to be there. It is a, it's a nonsense that Australia doesn't have an anti-corruption body. And it only deals with things on an ad hoc basis. And there are, I can assure you, 
once one's established in this country, it's going to be pretty busy. No doubt about it. And that's another way of holding power to account. No doubt about it. So there's quite a few questions about the future of journalist, journalism. And um, do you see, are you optimistic, pessimistic about the future of journalism, given um, uh, the advent of social media and the strong social media platforms uh, that are competing heavily with the more traditional forms of journalism? And some people have asked about the role of citizen journalism. And is that, for all the problems of social media, is that also a, a real positive? You know, what, what, what is your view about the future of journalism and the role of citizen journalism? I'm always terrified about citizen journalism, Larry, because there's a fine line between citizen journalism and vigilante journalism. Now, I've never trained or been qualified as a journalist. I'm not going to do the whole John Laws, oh, I'm, a, I'm an entertainer, I'm not a journalist thing. I worked as a journalist for 30 years at the ABC. But my initial training and my initial work experience for seven years was as a, as a lawyer. And I took that thinking into the media with me. And I think it's been rather handy actually, because it's that whole thing of asking a question rather than asking an answer. I mean, the number of times I find, I'm becoming one of those people, you know, those stale pale male whale types. I find myself shouting at the radio. I find myself shouting at the television. It's like, oh my God, what am I turning into? But how many times do you hear someone interviewing a person, typically a politician, and they ask them an answer instead of asking them a question? And how many times do you hear them? I mean, this is my favourite, you know. I used to use this in training at the ABC when I had, you know, bright and bushy-tailed, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed young things coming through and I'd conduct, conduct workshops for them from time to time. And I really enjoyed it. Um, you hear somebody on a current affairs program, there's been a terrible bombing in the main square in Baghdad. It's absolutely shocking. There's 27 people dead and 53 people injured. And this is a massive setback for the coalition-led forces. Larry Kamenar's on the scene. Larry, well, what's left for you to say? Nothing except, yes, that's right. In fact, the question should be, there's been a terrible bombing in the market square in Baghdad. Larry Kamenar is there, Larry. And then Larry says, oh, yes, there's 37 people dead and 54 injured. This is a huge setback for the US-led coalition. And you go, what is going wrong here? Where in the style guide did it say that you're supposed to show off the fact that you've done a bit of prep and you know what's going on and steal the oxygen out of the room for your guest? Anytime a guest answers a question saying, yes, that's right, there's a flaw in the question. It's been wrongly structured. But about the younger generation coming through, yes, we're going through a transition now, and certainly I bleed for the people who are being required to leave the ABC, and some of them have said, you beauty, I'm out of here, give me the check, and others have said, you're kidding, I wanted to work here for another five or 10 years, and some of my good friends are amongst those. So it's very, very hard. But over time, it'll heal itself. And once some of the stale pale male whales, people like me, get out of the way, having passed on, hopefully, before going out the door, having passed on a few tricks, other people get a chance, other people get an opportunity, just like I got one 30 years ago, and they will, I'm sure, they will stretch their wings and they'll fly. The, the whole digital thing, it's undoubtedly in transition. It's in transition from only a decade ago when some of these platforms didn't even exist. So we're still making up the rules. So when I spoke before about the need to take away anonymity, well, governments around the world are now grappling with it and trying to find ways of reining in some of the excesses. The sooner that happens, the better. At the moment, it's taking a terrible toll and it's unacceptable. So building on that, I mean, you've talked about the, I mean, we're all aware of the potential downsides of social media. There's obviously also tremendous upsides of it as well. Um, and I think you indicated that the real issue is is focus on how to regulate it properly. Um, and we're still in the early years of, of social media. But what are your thoughts about how social media can be better policed or regulated so that it becomes more of a force for good and less of a force for bad? Everything needs to be regulated. Every single thing, whether it's a bank, whether it's a media company, whether it's food services, whether it's aged care services. I mean, every of the inquiries, every one of the inquiries that we were talking about before, they've all come down to a failure of regulation. I mean, it's comical. You look at what's going on in Victoria Police. Gobbo, it's breathtaking. I don't know anybody who thinks. I don't, and, you know, I've still got good mates who work in the law and tragically too many of them are judges now, but even still... 
you talk to people who are still working in the law or who have now started to retire my coterie in the mid 60s there's not a single person there who thinks that a tightening up of a rule here or there is going to make a difference gobbo broke every rule there was you don't need new rules you just need to enforce the rules that were there and the fact that it was never properly enforced and the police were unaccountable not the legal profession that's where the problem lies. I, mean, I think there's a real issue about the power of Victoria Police at the moment uh, and the power of the association, the police association. They've always been a formidable power in Victoria. I think they're more powerful now than they've ever been. It's been interesting, Dan Andrews, one of the first things he did was he said to the Herald Sun, you don't run this town anymore. You campaigned against me being elected. I'm not going to give you stories on the drop the way every government has right through Victorian modern history. I'm not going to nurse you, feed you, indulge you and dance to your tune. And said the same to uh, 3AW, said the same to my counterpart, Neil Mitchell, after they had a big argument. He said, that's it, I'm not coming back here to be treated like a schoolboy, which was great for me because I had access to the Premier, but Neil never did from that moment on and still to this day hasn't. So Dan Andrews has done something extraordinary, which we've never seen. In Sydney, the shock jocks and the tabloids, they pretty much feel that they run the town. In Victoria, things have changed. It's a really good book. Bruce Guthrie, who used to be an editor for the Herald Sun, wrote a really interesting book. He had a falling out with the Murdoch empire. It's a long and complicated story, but he wrote a book about it. He sued the Murdochs and he won. The only One of the very few people who have successfully sued the Murdochs from, from within, some of their staff, and he won a damages payout for unjust dismissal. And in his book, it's a really interesting book if you're interested in the media, it's called Man Bites Dog. And there's one little bit in it which you put it down and go, aha, I just had a light bulb moment from that. And Bruce tells the story of how when he was shown into his office as the editor of the Herald Sun, and he's shown the corner office and here's where the, you know, the toilets are down the corridor and here's the kitchen and someone will bring you a cup of tea and here's the car park pass. And then he was told from this office, you have to think that you run this state, you run this town. That's the mindset as the editor of the Herald Sun you have to have. And he tells that story against himself in a way, but that's the mindset that the tabloid editor is supposed to have. And that's the mindset they have at the Courier Mail and Daily Telegraph in Sydney as well. It's a terribly corrosive thing. And to his credit, what Andrews has done is he said, I don't buy that. You guys are never gonna be my friends. You've campaigned against me from day one and I'm never going to dance to your tune because that's, that's a slippery slope. I'm not gonna do it. It's been a really interesting shift. He's the only premier that I know of who's had you know, that full on stoush with a Murdoch tabloid editor and won. Now, you know, we'll wait and see what happens at the next state election, but certainly for the time being, he seems to have, um, well, the, all the polls say somewhere between 60 and 70% support from the people of Victoria at the moment. We'll see if it sustains or not. I should uh, say that one of the, one of the, one of the uh, amusing headlines that I saw, because I, I, uh, I do read the Australian, um, I sort of feel one should read all sources and uh, was... And it's, a, it's, a fine, it's a fine paper. I want to make that absolutely clear. I read it every day. It's an excellent paper. It's just got some extraordinary right out there um, perspectives on a couple of things. It's extraordinary. Well, I, the, the, the thing I was referring to was as a headline in The Australian which said, shock poll result, 60% of people support Dan Andrews. And uh -huh. it sort of was missing the brackets, despite our best efforts. Well, it, it actually went further. Can I correct you? It actually said, not yet ready to dump Andrews. Yes. Yes. How extraordinary. So, not yet ready to dump Andrews. That was the view of a sub-editor at The Australian. Oh, and there, this whole Stockholm Syndrome stuff. I mean, mostly written by people who didn't live, don't live in Melbourne and were writing from afar based on what they were being told by, I don't know, Terry McCran and Robert Gottliebson and whoever else. I mean, it's just, it's a parallel universe. I don't get it. John, there's a number of questions about uh, the ABC being, I guess, the other sort of one of the other major uh, remaining uh, bastions of journalism and, and, you know, views of what's going on. Um, in your 30 years or so of being associated with the ABC, how have you seen a change? Um, has it all been, I mean, one presumably can quickly get into a story of declining resources, et cetera, et cetera. Is it all a sort of a downward slope? Are there some positives? What's your take on how the ABC has changed over the last 30 years and what can be done about it going forward? Well, the thing that can be done about it is people need to 
continue to use it and rely upon it and trust it as much as they always have. And it's been one of the absolutely humbling privileges of my life to be just one tiny little link in that incredibly honourable chain. So, you know, it's the most trusted brand in Australia. And I don't think that's, personally, I don't think that's in any risk of, of changing. The ABC goes through all sorts of stresses and strains. I remember during the Gulf War, Bob Hawke wanted our guts for garters. And then John Howard during the second Iraq war wanted my guts for garters because I dared ask him. In fact, it's a great story. He was on his way back from going, he, you might remember just before we started joining in the coalition of the willing with George W. Bush and Tony Blair, John Howard flew to London in order to consult about whether or not we would join in against Saddam. He came back and he was in transit in Dubai and we got a phone call while we were on air, I think it was, or about to go to air, saying, oh, Prime Minister's doing the rounds of, uh, of Capital City stations. Do you want five minutes, 10 minutes with the PM this morning? And we went, absolutely. So he obviously was trying to get the message across and he came on air and said, you know, I've consulted widely and carefully before making a decision. I'll announce my decision when I get back to Australia. And I said, so Prime Minister, just explain to us, you've met with Tony Blair, yes, you have, and you've spoken to George W. Bush, yes, I have at great length, and it's been very sobering. I said, hmm. did you consult with any of the people who are against going to war while you're in London? And that silence was what I got. Afterwards, I was told, um, you're playing dirty pool, that wasn't appreciated. To which I went, well, guess what, too bad. You come on the show, you get asked questions. Don't like the questions? Too bad. If you can't answer them, your problem, not mine. That's my job. But I thought it was very revealing. And John Howard was a master at live radio. He did it almost every day of his prime ministership. At least two or three times a week, at least, if not every day, wherever he was in the country, he'd pop up on a radio somewhere. And he would come into the studio to answer questions. And he would come in, and this is very unusual for politicians, he would come in and he would not have a single note or piece of paper in front of him. Most politicians will come in, they've got a folder full of the daily briefings and it's colour coded and it's got little post-it notes and little tabs here and there, you know, budget and this, infrastructure, whatever it might be. John Howard, he'd come in, he'd say hello, he'd chat to you about the cricket or whatever else. And very pleasant, very engaging, always got on very well. And then he would just take whatever was thrown at him. Absolutely amazing. Uh, but that time he was completely stuck. And I thought, yep, that pretty much tells us all we need to know. You went to London, you consulted widely with people who were in favour of going to war. It's hardly surprising that we're going to go to war. Now, I want to see more of that. I want to see more of people being put on the spot. I want to see more of people doing interviews with politicians where they're asked questions that they can't answer or wish they weren't asked. And one of the things, this is a real bugbear of mine, and it's getting a bit nasty here, but hey, what the hell. I... I bristle every time I hear a journalist say, can I ask? It's your job to ask. You don't seek permission to ask a question. Just ask it and demand an answer. And if you don't get an answer, I once asked Simon Crean seven times the same question about the price of petrol. And by the seventh time, we were both giggling, but I made the point. You're not answering. And you have to do that. You have to hold them to account. I've noticed Lee Sales, you know, excellent interviewer. Lee Sales has started to say on TV, this is the 11th time we've invited the Minister for Aged Care to come on the program. You just have to keep doing that. In fact, you have to start running a tally saying, this week we've asked the following ministers who refuse to come on because it's a political hot potato. Back to John Howard, if he had a problem with one of his ministers, and Amanda Vanstone tells this story in her memoirs, if you were in trouble, you were told by John Howard personally, you go out, you go and see Kerry O'Brien and you face the music. And if you can't deal with that, you don't, you don't have your job anymore. That's part of doing your job to face the music. Not anymore. And I think we have to get back to that. We urgently have to. So we're getting close to the hour, but we will run this um, 10 minutes past the hour because there was a and I won't get to anywhere near all the questions. I think we've got 51 open questions here on my Q&A, so my apologies to all those people. We won't get to their questions, but we will run it uh, 10 minutes past past the hour. Um, I think we should be like Dan um, Anderson the press conference. We should just keep going until we've answered every question that anybody's got. Well, we could do that. Um, we, the numbers might start to drop after a little while, <laughs> but, uh, but that's okay. Um, although I understand that the... Uh, that in the ratings for his daily briefings have been quite phenomenal, which is sort of interesting in its own right in terms of... Oh, yeah, there's um, something there. 
Yeah. Actually, um, let me just just take let me just take that. What do, what do you think of his um, on the issue of accountability? Just in terms of politically, what do you think of Daniel Andrews's daily briefing? A smart thing to do. Good thing to do. Oh yeah. Not so smart. Whatever. No, no, no it's been a brilliant thing to do, and uh, he's sustained it way beyond what I thought he would or could. And I don't just mean that in terms of the number of days, but I even mean within each one of them. Uh, I cannot understand. He is so patient. I couldn't do what he's doing. I'd snap at some point. I'd, I'd just want a piece of some of those people and I'd go, oh, I'm going to put you in your place. He's never done that. And that's to his credit. It's extraordinary. Uh, and the reason he does it that way, I'm sure, is because it's working for them. It works so well for them. And you might see, you know how the, this is a bit of a jump here, but the way the AFL now employ more football writers than the rest of the media combined. You might start finding that even after this pandemic, Dan Andrews might decide that he wants to do a podcast. He might decide he wants to do a vodcast, a videocast. He might want to do something along the lines of Dan TV and say, okay, I'm going to bypass the journalists. I'm going to talk directly to the people. Here it is. And, you know, he might be in conversation with one of his ministers or with one of his minders, or they might get someone to come in and put him through his paces and say, you know what, I don't, I don't need the radio stations. I don't need those nasty unpleasant people anymore. I can go straight to the population and give them my message direct. You're seeing that on social media and that's what Instagram, Twitter, all those platforms, politicians do that, but it's quite limited in its potential. You might see some more of it. People are playing around with these different models. They'll come up with all sorts of innovations, the likes of which were unimaginable just 10 minutes ago. Now, I realise I wasn't doing my job very well because I asked you a question which I think you just sidestepped before, so I'm going to come back to it. Um, <laughs> I asked you what, you what you thought had happened to the ABC over the last 30 years, good, bad, otherwise. Um, I think you jumped into the what needs to happen going forward, but go retrospective, 30 years ago, 1989, tell us how it's changed in your view. One of the biggest and most dramatic changes, and it's very much for the better, is emergency broadcasting and certainly live and local radio, which I worked in, has, uh, we were dragged and i can tell you this personally because it was me we were dragged kicking and screaming to doing that and we had a boss a guy called ian mannix who was our manager at the time who thought that we could do better than just having breaking news from the police or the fire brigade we could actually get involved in covering some of these emergencies and then we found black saturday and i was on air throughout both the initial night and it's left me with a bit of scarring uh, and then constantly thereafter in a way that was unimaginable when i started out and there were people who worked with me who went I'm not up for this. This isn't what I came here to do. I'm out of here. And there are other people who said, this is extraordinary. This has cemented our relationship with the community in a way that nothing else has ever achieved. And it's true. So in terms of local radio, the ABC's discovered that it's got this role to play and it's absolutely fantastic. It's expensive though, because for every hour of emergency broadcasting, there's multiple hours of training and there's extraordinary systems and protocols and procedures that are in place through summer starting soon every abc capital city radio station and large regional ones will have a 24-hour emergency coordinator presence all through the summer for emergencies and then there are phone trees and buttons you can push if things go pear-shaped and everything just leaps in but people have drilled for it they've trained for it some of the things that we're doing now, there's a much bigger emphasis for reasons entirely to do with the government, much bigger emphasis on reporting from the regions, from outside of capital cities. The ABC was terribly Sydney centric. Mark Scott was a fabulous managing director, but he centralised much of the ABC into Sydney. I tackled him on it once live on air and said, this is terrible. It's bad for the organisation. It's not, it's not the ABC anymore. It's the Sydney Broadcasting Corporation. And he said, well, we're under financial pressure. It's cheaper to run everything in Sydney. It used to be that the executive of the ABC, the top managers, were spread and distributed around the capital cities, but now not anymore. They're all in Sydney. That was reflected for years in its coverage, and this government, quite rightly, has challenged it. So there's been a big emphasis on recruiting people, sadly very junior people, all of them, because they're cheap, let's be honest. And they've improved the staffing in a lot of regional ABC centres, and that's given us a lot of content. So you look at the television news, for instance, there's a lot more stories coming to you from remote locations and regional centres than ever was the case. Sadly, though, that's meant there's been a loss of specialisation in some other areas. And a lot of the very experienced people who are specialists, they're the ones who have taken redundancies. And I think there's been a lot of 
combined wisdom that's gone out the door and that's going to take a while to rebuild. Overall, I don't, I don't buy for a moment the arguments people say that it's losing its independence or it's losing its, its internal culture. It's much more resilient than that. And I'm, I'm absolutely sure the ABC will be as robust and as uh, thorough in its core job as it's ever been. That won't change. So there's a question here about um, have the historical channels of protests and activism become less relevant? Um, and again, maybe social media taking over some of that. What do you think is the most effective form of um, protest and activism as a, you know, an observer or participant? Well, no, as, a, as an activist too, although my activism had to be suspended for decades, but I was very much, a, I was a student activist and then I was a, an agitator and an activist as a young lawyer and at Fitzroy Legal Service, you're actually paid to be a shit stirrer. So, hey, how good was that? But uh, I, I think activism, there is no higher or more noble cause than being an activist because it means you're active, you're participating, you're involved, you're not just being a spectator. And there's nothing worse in my view than just being a spectator to history. You've got to actually be in there. As Mao Zedong said, if you want to understand an apple, you have to eat it. You can't describe an apple, you have to eat an apple. If you want to get involved in changing things, if you want to make progress happen, you have to be involved in it, you have to be active in it. One of the things that troubles me at the moment, I touched on it before, I think that progressives are actually being outflanked at the moment. And I think that what we're seeing is that some of the conservatives and some of the conservative activists are more creative, more organised. They may be better resourced. That may be something to do with it. I don't know. But I actually think the left has lost its edge a little bit at the moment. It's partly because it's fragmented, not just in Australia, but I mean in other countries as well. And if you look across the broad sweep of the world, there's, there's weird stuff going on, particularly in Europe, uh, in England, Poland, Hungary, Russia, Turkey, Philippines. America and you see the rise of these these authoritarian figures and you go well, what's going on here uh, China I mean the suppression of civil rights and human rights in China the oppression of ethnic minorities the jailing now of journalists and lawyers anybody who speaks up Hong Kong dare I say it it's just terrible and I don't quite think we don't yet understand if this is a blip on the radar or if there's something else going on of people losing faith in the fundamentals of democracy and saying, well, actually, you know what, we don't have to be democratic. We can have progress through other ways. We can have prosperity without democracy. Personally, I don't think you can. Every example in history that we've seen ends up when you take away freedom and democracy, eventually it might take a while, but eventually it falls over. But, you know, I'm a fan of Thomas Piketty, which is that capitalism works best when it's not as unequal as it is at the moment. In fact, it's better for the growth of an economy to iron out some of the bumps and get rid of some of the extremes and bring, you know, you've got to have something that brings people down and from the super rich and you've got to bring people up so that they're consumers rather than being pushed onto the scrap heap. We'll see whether or not, you know, in due course, whether or not that bears fruit or not. But uh, I don't pretend to have the answers on what's going on with Orban and Duterte and, uh, you know, all the, the oligarchs who are in power around the place. I, I, I think I do understand Vladimir Putin and Russia. It's not that complicated. Um, Russia worked out they couldn't compete with the West economically, militarily, culturally, in a whole lot of ways they couldn't compete. But they could undo the West using our Achilles heel, which is our openness and our freedoms. And Putin, who I think is just unadulteratedly evil, has worked out he can personally enrich himself. And depending on who you believe, I interviewed Bill Browder a while ago, who's responsible for the Magnitsky laws after his dear friend who was killed by the Russians because he was starting to undo some of the corruption there. And, you know, you just go, how can this, ha how can this be happening in our world? You know, we think we're sophisticated and we think we have a good handle on things, but no, Putin's out of control. He's reputed to be the richest person in the world now, and it's still not enough. And, you know, poisoning your enemies and saying, well, I don't even care, even if everyone points the finger at us, we don't care. It's not as if it was all done terribly subtly, was it? So until some of this stuff, until we get a better handle on it, I don't know, you know, it's, it's weird. It's weird. And I think, you know, probably that you'd find very few dissenters on the, on the question of Putin. She is a more complex, 
slightly more complex era. Do you see she is very much going down a, a economically more successful version of of Putin, or do you feel? I mean, what is your how positive negative are you about the future of China and Australia's relationship with China, which is clearly under stress at the moment? But um, where do you think that can and should go? I will not be surprised at 64 now, just as of last week, and thank you. It was good fun. Uh, at 64, I won't be surprised if I live to see another revolution in China. Uh, China, the people of China have, they're the classic example. They've traded freedoms for prosperity. And they have, through our lifetime, they have been dragged out of mass poverty in a way that history's never, never seen before. It's extraordinary. And you have to give China credit and the communist government credit for what they've done. But they've entered a new phase now. So they've entered a phase now where they're consolidating and they have to transition to a services economy because they, in fact, don't enjoy a comparative advantage of cheap labour and the like necessarily over some other emerging economies, particularly India. So we're going to see China start to be stress tested. And at the same time, some of the social media and other technology that you've talked about before is a terrible threat. China operates the greatest censorship operation that humanity's ever seen. I don't think they can get away with it forever. And I don't think they're getting away with it all that well now. So I'm expecting that China, if it, that's why they're so determined to stamp down on what's going on in Hong Kong, because that's a sign of what could come. So they will use whatever they need to, whether it's concentration camps for Uyghurs or Tibetans or, you know, it doesn't matter which ethnic minority, they will be as brutal as any regime has ever been. And I, at some stage, if Australia has to, we're going to have to work out what we do about it. At the moment, we're walking this incredible tightrope. We're still trading with the Chinese whilst condemning them. At some point, they may say, no, you're either with us or you're against us, in which case, you know, we find other markets for our products. And yes, the boom might suddenly come to a very sudden end. But I don't think we're as dependent on China as some people make out. Yes, yeah, sure. We're doing a lot of trade with China at the moment, but we're producing things that other places in the world want. They may pay a slightly lower price, but we have to spread the risk. We have to stop being so dependent on just one major customer, not just for iron ore, but for produce, for resources of all kinds, as well as for some of the other more sophisticated things. I mean, I, one of the things this pandemic's done is that it's forced us to confront the dependence that our university sector has had on in particular Chinese students, dependent on overseas students for a lot of the cash, but particularly China. Well, there were too many eggs in that basket already. So in a way, I think it's done us a favour. It's forced us to confront the fact that we had swung a lot of our tertiary sector across to one market, and you never want to be dependent on one market. It doesn't matter what you're selling, whether you're selling widgets or whether you're selling student, uh, student positions in universities, you have to be more diverse. You just have to be. We're seeing that now with the onshoring of supply chains. We don't want to be dependent on importing essentials from China. So we're going to have to go back to making things ourselves. Hey, what a novel idea, Australia making things. Whoever decided to shut down the car industry, who thought that was a good idea? Things come around. Um back onto the sort of social media angle, um, one of the things that people are very worried about and is the sort of the bubble mentality with people in, in their own echo chambers. And as a result of which people becoming more and more intolerant of other views, I think the absence or the reduced role for a sort of a mainstream media as a, as a sort of midpoint on, on views with most people now listening, or many people, and maybe it's not worse than, you know, it's worse than some other countries such as the US, but with people increasingly looking just to their own news channels is, is obviously exacerbating uh, people's views in many respects and making political dialogue less, or arguably making it less um, civil and, and made less able to move forward. I mean, A, do you agree that that is where things are going? And if so, what, what can be done about it? I'm not absolutely sure just yet. There's some research being done, some of which is coming out fairly soon that's going to tell us whether, whether that, in fact, is what's happening or not. What I suspect is happening here is not as bad as people make out. Yes, yeah, sure, there's a bit of a hollowing out of the media centre and a polarisation at either extreme, but a lot of it is people just very loud voices that are numerically very small. And they're shouting at each other and becoming increasingly hostile and toxic, but not a lot of other people are taking notice. And I suspect that's what's happening. I think the sensible centre will hold, and I hope it does. 
Twitter is not an indication of anything. If you get, I mean, it's good for information, but if you're trying to get a measure of public opinion from Twitter, well, you're doomed. Likewise, Facebook, likewise, Instagram, that's not the real world. Only a fraction of the population participate in some of those forums, political forums. And it's not an indication of anything in the real world. So we're gonna see what happens there. I suspect what's going on is in fact, most people will continue to rely when they need to on mainstream media, when they need to, and they turn to the ABC. We've seen that with the last radio ratings. Talk radio has gone through the roof in every capital city, but especially Sydney and Melbourne, which have been worst hit by the pandemic. And the ABC has picked up significantly, along with commercial radio too, commercial talk radio. But people abandoned a lot of the kind of, you know, the, 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 the lifestyle and the telling jokes type programs and the music programs and came back to talk because they needed information live and local live and local live and local they wanted to get it from people they trusted the challenge for those talk radio programs is to hold on to those audiences post pandemic and make them find that, they, that they're happy with that way of getting information and becoming part of the extended family for instance that a radio program or a breakfast tv program for that matter which ratings are also up that they become so I think we're going to see, you know, we talked before about the social media side of things, but the, the sensible centre, I suspect it's going to hold. I suspect when people need information, they'll know where to go for it. And meanwhile, some of those yelling, screaming matches become irrelevant. I'll give you a quick example also. Um, back about uh, six, seven weeks ago, at the height of the Victorian second wave, uh, I was just watching TV one night and I saw some government ads about COVID and I thought, oh God, they don't cut it. They just don't get through it all. And so I got in touch with someone I know who's very senior in the health department. And I said, look, those ads are shit. I'm sorry, there's no other way to say it. They're just not working. Um, you've got to think of a different way. You've got to use the carrot, not the stick. And this person said, what do you mean? And I told them what I thought and I thought I was giving them some advice. And then she got back to me the next day and she said, can you just send me an email? So I sent her an email. It was just a couple of paragraphs, pretty much saying that. And here's a few ideas. And I thought I was just helping them out. The next thing I know is a few days later, she said, can you put that into a proposal? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, look, there's a bit of interest here. Just develop it into a page or two. So I did. And then she got back to me and said, can you give us a budget? And I had no idea. I've never made an ad before. I've spent 30 years working for an organisation that doesn't do ads. Uh, so I got some advice from people and I ended up finding that I was making a series of eight social media and television ads for the health department about COVID. So there was Magda Zubansky and Shane Jacobson and Matt Preston and that whole series of ads, which you can see readily if you do a search for them. The reporting after they were launched by the Premier was all about the fact that Magda and Shane were being trolled fat shamed for, you know, oh, taking health advice from someone as fat or as unhealthy as you was what basically I'm putting a polite version of it out there. And yet within a, four days of those ads being released, there were 1.3 million views. The trolling was a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand people. There is no equivalence between 1.3 million views of the ads and a thousand trolls. There just isn't. But if all you knew was what was reported in the media, you'd think they were the trolls were in the majority because the trolls were what got reported because it's a bad news story, because it's interesting to the people who make news. Oh, controversy. Oh, look, there's an ant's nest. Let's, put it, let's poke a stick in it and watch all the ants scurry around. But it's not. It's a complete false equivalence. It's a nonsense. The ads were an unbelievable success. I'm delighted. I couldn't be happier. I hope they did something to make Victorians safer and end this lockdown. But the way the media and some parts of the media reported them was like, oh, these ads are controversial. Oh, there's a massive backlash against Magda Zhivansky and Shane Jacobson. There wasn't. It was tiny, but it was very noisy. So that's an answer to your question. I don't think the noise reflects the numbers. So, John, um, I am going to wind up with one last question. And despite the fact that of the open 55 questions, a whole lot of them have said just keep going all night because what else do we have to do in Melbourne at the moment? And, uh, <laughs> but I won't, I, won't, I, won't take up, uh, I won't take up that suggestion. Um, although I can share one of the other questions here, which is when are you, when are you coming back on the radio, John? Um, um, so my last question is, um, and we did chat about this a little bit before, um, everyone joined, maybe a few of you joined early, heard it, might have, might have heard it. Um, what are your thoughts about 
who's going to win the grand final? And what's your thoughts about the AFL season this year? Uh, I completely agree with your prognostication that it's helped when football came back. There was a collective sigh of relief and there was just the sort of the, the inkling of normality returning to our lives and something that would distract us and give us some pleasure. And yes, the AFL have done an extraordinary job in being able to find a way and apparently a 99% safe way. They've had a few casualties along the way of people who broke the rules. Uh, they found a way of getting back into competition and salvaging something from 2020. And they're not the only sporting code that's done it. Others have done it too. Um, and I think, yes, yeah, sport is essential. It's essential. Um, some of the other things are not, but sport, I mean, I miss my shambolic super vets over 60s hockey. Um, as we shuffle around and laugh at each other. And there's a few people who take it more seriously than the rest of us. But being, being involved in those things is really important. And for some people, they get enormous satisfaction and enormous pleasure out of barracking for their football club and supporting their team. It's the, it's the, the lubricant for, in particular, Melbourne, but a lot of Australia. It's the, the grease that keeps the cogs turning and keeps the machine moving. There's no doubt about it. Um, who's going to win? Well, of course, the mighty Brisbane Lions, Fitzroy relocated, are going to. And yes, St Kilda, congratulations. They've done well to get this far. But I think in their minds, getting into the finals and winning a final might be what they regarded as their, end, their, their goal. And Paddy Ryder's injury is going to be a very cruel one to have to adapt to. Uh, I thought last night's game, I started watching it thinking, I'm not going to watch this because I'm, you know, Collingwood I mean for goodness sake who cares but no it was a cracker of a game it was fabulous and everything you want a football game to be and you've got to congratulate Nathan Buckling and his team they're just extraordinary they never give up and to do that in the west against the west was amazing so look I think okay down to six it's going to get down to four I still think the week off is a huge advantage so we'll see exactly who gets there on um, what's not going to be the last weekend in September but it's going to be a great game when it gets there whatever happens. John, well, look, um, I'm going to hand over to Marty in a second to, to formally thank you. But uh, I just want to say it's been wonderful talking to you. Um, it's been wonderful sort of role reversing, playing role reversing with you in the conversation hour. Um, I've certainly enjoyed it. I'm glad we got to the heart of Melbourne at the end of the discussion. I'm also glad that I think we, were, we got through over an hour without talking about uh, events in the US, which is nice to have had a US free zone for, uh, for an hour, which is sort of hard to find at the moment, but I think that's been an achievement. So, so thank you. I uh, look forward to um, uh, staying in touch. And on that note, I'll, I'll hand over to Marty. Thanks, Larry. So John, thank you very much for the generosity of your time and for being the 11th orator. Gemma, thank you very much for coming and being part of this, this event. And Riley, congratulations. We didn't see you today, but we'll hopefully meet you soon. Everyone, thank you for coming and giving us your time. And for those who've donated to the scholarship, we really appreciate your generosity. And we look forward to meeting everyone again next year. And this will be up on the, the Renata Kamina website shortly if you want to uh, see it again or view it at a later stage. Thank you, everyone.